so good. Father Jim, how are you doing today? Welcome. I'm good, Beto. Thank you so much for having me on your show. It's a real honor. Awesome. Super excited for today's conversation. Um, let's kick off with an emoji. Are you ready for that? We're going to go to the Belifo meter and we're going to see what's going to be the emoji reaction for today. So for that, let's kick off with the emoji tombola. And we're starting with the divine emoji. Divine emoji. Father Jim, why is that your strongest idea today? Well, um, you know, if you look at all the different emojis you have, uh, it was a kind of obvious choice cause because we're going to be talking about Jesus' greatest miracle. So you can't get much more divine than that. Awesome. There we have it. Oh, so good, so good, so good. So, Father Jim, just tell us a little bit of who you are and what you do before I move on with my first question on the show, because I, I think it's epic what you do. So, would you tell us a little bit about that? Of course. So, I'm a Jesuit priest, which means I'm a member of a Catholic religious order, and a lot of people know religious orders like the Franciscans or the Benedictines or the Trappists. A lot of people know uh, the Jesuits now because Pope Francis is a Jesuit. So it's a it's a religious order. We we live in community. We take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. In the United States, where I think most of the listeners are, um, we're probably best known for our schools: Georgetown, Boston College, Loyola Mar Marymount, uh, Loyola, New Orleans. All the ones named Loyola after our founder. Our high schools, but we also do a lot of work in retreat ministry. We work with uh, refugees and migrants, for example, along the border, um, you know, right now. So we do all sorts of things. And uh, so I've been a Jesuit since 1988. I was ordained in 1999. And since uh, ordination, uh, I've been working at America Magazine, which is a Catholic magazine, and in the process, writing uh, writing some books here and there, and the, including this most recent one. So that's, that's who I am. That's what I do. Love it. Just want to, I want to say, you know, I come from Guadalajara, Mexico, and there's a, my sister went to this university, it's called ITESO, Instituto Tecnológico de Estudios Superiores de Occidente, for short, ITESO, and I think it's a Jesuit university. Are you familiar with, like, universities in other countries or no? Uh, you know, I am. I'm embarrassed to say I don't know if that one is, but let me just say there are a lot of Jesuits in Guadalajara. I know okay. that. Yeah. And in fact, uh, some friends of mine are studying Spanish now, right now, mm. uh, who I'm kind of their spiritual counselor. And so we do Zoom calls every month and I hear about how things are going in Guadalajara and how their Spanish is going. So, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if that was a Jesuit school. Okay. Yeah, I think it is. It's called Iteso. Maybe we'll, I'll research a little bit more about that, but okay. that's where my sister went to school. Cool. And it was pretty fairly close to where I used to live. So anyways, that's kind of like just maybe something we have in common, I would say. And that's pretty epic. And I want to move on to maybe another topic that we might have in common, because today's like main idea, I want it to be about the resurrection, one of Jesus, but then also the resurrection of Lazarus, which I think is what your book focuses on. Um, so for that, would you agree or, or would you like, do you believe in the like the Apostles Creed and could you recite it? Right, right now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe in it. I believe in the Nicene Creed. That's the one I'm more familiar with. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, it's funny. I don't know if I could do it right off the bat. I mean, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I believe in all that. I believe in everything in the Creed, in both of them. Okay. The Nicene Creed, which we say at Sunday Mass, uh, and the Apostles' Creed, which is shorter, which I don't know that one as well. But yeah, I, I believe in it all. Okay, so it's in there. I, I mean, I, I think the last time I checked it, it says, I believe in the resurrection of the body, right? That's one of the versions yeah. I know. So yeah. that's something you would say, yes, for sure, I believe in the resurrection of the body. Absolutely. I mean, I believe in it all. So anything okay. that's in the creed. Yeah, I mean, it means that, um, you know, at the, at the end times, right? Um, at the end times, there will be this general resurrection. But also, you know, for those of us who, um, you know, who are believers and die and we go to heaven and we're going to be... We're going to be with God. We're going to be with Jesus and with our friends and relatives, you know, happy forever. But there is going to be a general resurrection, too. So what what the what the end times are like, we don't really know. You can't tell. But, yeah, I believe in it all. 
Nice. Wow, that's awesome. Okay. So what is it that you're trying to say with your book, Come Forward? I was saying even before we started recording the show, I haven't really gotten to it, cause, but it's on my queue. Right now I'm, I'm listening to Amy Jill Levin, and she, I love Amy Jill. She's just amazing. And I think she, she mentioned a few comments on your book, um, but I, I think you said, you know, I have something to say along those lines. So uh, what are you trying to say with this book, Come Forth? Yeah, sure. Well, I hope you. Uh, I I actually narrated my book too, so you can listen to that one as nice. well. Nice. Uh, had a lot of fun doing it. And Amy Jill Levine's work is a real big part of this book. So basically, uh, the book is what you might call a deep dive, uh, a real sort of deep investigation into the story of the raising of Lazarus. And for people who don't know, that's in the Gospel of John. And very briefly, uh, there's a man named Lazarus who's the brother of Mary and Martha in Bethany. Uh, they send word to Jesus that he is ill, and Jesus comes. He delays a little bit. Uh, the sisters greet him, uh, and then he goes to the tomb and calls out, Lazarus, come forth, or Lazarus, come out, depending on the translation, and he raises him from the dead. So the book is basically, uh, it looks at how that story can invite us, all of us, you know, including you and me, Beto, uh, to leave behind anything that really keeps us sort of unfree or bound you know what i mean we all have those things in our lives that are just like you know we, they're kind of burdens and to hear god call us into new life um so the book looks at the story you know kind of uh, part by part you know takes it apart looks at the spiritual meaning of of each of the parts does a little bit of travelogue you know like sort of says like what is it like today where lazarus was raised from the dead you, you can go to the tomb and also a little bit of lazarus in kind of culture of films movies, um, you know, songs, history, fine arts. So it's it's really kind of like looking at this story and saying, what does it mean for us today? What does the story of Jesus' raising Lazarus mean for us today? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's great. Okay, so before we, we talked about what does it mean, I just want to kind of like plug here a couple of episodes I have done in the past where I've talked with one, Amy Jill Levin, and Marks V. Brettler, I think it's episode number six. Uh, but just check that out, you know. And the other one is, I talked with an Anglican priest. He lives in Washington, and he was mentored by Eugene Peterson, which did a paraphrase of the Bible, which I really love. It's called The Message. And, and the reason I bring him is because we were talking a little bit about that uh, happening in Bethany, in this city where Jesus comes and resurrects Lazarus. And I love that you just the word delays right like jesus came in uh for for many people it seemed like he came a few days too late, late. right uh so i mean that's it's just an epic story so maybe could you i don't know maybe summarize the story for people that are maybe unfamiliar with that uh as it relates to you know like the, the town of bethany and who were these main characters you know lazarus the sisters Sure. Yeah. So a little a little longer telling of the story. So basically the story starts out. It's in John chapter 11 and it says a certain man was ill. His name was Lazarus. They introduce him as the brother of Mary and Martha. Now, Mary and Martha, we know from Luke's gospel are the ones that hosted Jesus in their house. Uh, and it says that Mary and Martha send word to Jesus, who at this point is across the Jordan River. He's been kind of he's been uh, threatened with stoning. So he and his disciples have withdrawn. And they say in a very beautiful um, line, which I'm sure you know, he whom you love is ill, the one you love mm. is ill, which is really beautiful. I mean, they don't say Lazarus of Bethany is ill. They don't say Lazarus, our brother is ill, Lazarus, your disciple, he whom you love. Uh, and then the word reaches Jesus uh, and they say, well, maybe he's asleep. And Jesus says, no, he's dead. Lazarus is dead. Um, they, he waits two days, which, you know, he does delay. It's, it's very mysterious. We can talk about that later. He finally comes to Bethany, and when he arrives at Bethany, the first sister, Martha, rushes out and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, it's a bit of a profession of faith. I mean, she's saying who she believes he is, Lord. Mm. But it's also a bit of a complaint, you know, where were you? Um, and then the second sister comes out and says the exact same thing, Lord, if my, you had been here, my brother would not have died. He says, where have you laid him? Uh, they he, they say, come and see, which, as you know, is what Jesus says at the beginning of the Gospel of John, right? Come and see. They take him to the tomb. Um, Martha says, uh, he, he says, there, there's going to be a stench, says Martha. There's going to be a stink because he's been mm. dead four days. And he says, you know, do you believe in me? Do you believe that I'm, I'm the resurrection and the life? And she said, I believe that you're the Messiah. And Jesus says kind of more than what she even can understand. Then he says, take away the stone. 
Uh, and then he shouts out, come forth. He prays first and shouts out, come forth. Lazarus comes out in, in his grave cloth still, which is quite a powerful scene. And then Jesus says, untie him and let him go. So it really, it's an extraordinary um, miracle. It's often called his greatest miracle, which is why I call the book The Promise of Jesus' Greatest Miracle. And as I said, um, Beto, you know, it's something for us to believe in. So we believe in that, right? We believe Jesus has the power, um, you know, over death. We believe that he raised uh, Lazarus as well as two other people in the Gospels um, from the dead. But it's also sort of like, what does it mean for us? And how can we use that story in our own lives? And again, to let go of anything that keeps us bound or unfree and really hear God calling us to new life. That that So that's kind of the theme of, of the book. So it looks at that story and tries to help us understand how we how we can we can hear God's voice saying to us come forth. Wow, epic. Okay, we can hear God's voice uh calling us come forth. So I think what you're saying is it's not just for a Lazarus and maybe not even in the sense of uh, a bodily resurrection even though there's part of that like like you said, you know, when we're in heaven and we're you know with with friends and family for lack of better terms. But uh but also this sense of like here in this life Yes. We can have some sort of like re rebirth, right? Some people, I guess, you know, in my tradition, we say born again Christian, right? And it's almost like this idea that even though you have experienced life and you have experienced a birth, there's there's an there's a higher calling maybe. So is that is that kind of like where what you mean yeah. with this come well, forth? Let's, absolutely. Let's take a simple example. Let's say that um, uh, I'm going to come up with something. Let's say that y y you're you're burdened with um, you're very uh, y you're you're mean to people. Let's just say that. I know that you're not, but let's say you're you're, you're someone who's very sarcastic and you're mean and you're mm. short tempered and. And, and you know that this is something that you need to let go of, right? And mm. your friends tell you this, and maybe your your pastor tells you this, maybe a therapist tells you this, and they just say, you you know, you're really kind of, ne you're, you're negative, right? Mm. So the idea is that this is kind of preventing you from living a full life. This is preventing you from living a Christian life. This is preventing you from really being free, right? And mm. so what I think this story does is says to us, like, you can let go of that. You can let that die in the tomb, you know, just like Lazarus has to leave the tomb. You can let that go and you can hear God calling you through this desire to be a better person, through your friends inviting you to do this, through the scriptures inviting you to do this, and leave it behind and experience new life. Because I think people tend to think, I'm stuck, I'm never going to change, this is it, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just stuck as a mean or a sarcastic or a fearful or whatever or, or, or a disappointed or a kind of disgruntled person. Mm. So you're absolutely right. It's it's to say that this story, like all the gospel stories, has a has a meaning for us that is also applicable today in our daily lives. So that I just find it such a powerful image that Lazarus has to come forth. Lazarus has to get out of that tomb. You know. So where are we called to kind of get out of our tombs and let behind you know what keeps us unfree? And I I'd, I'd, I'd actually be interested in kind of asking you, Beto, when you hear that story and you say. What is it that is keeping me unfree? What what comes to your mind, uh, either in you or in other people, or what would you say? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's great, great question. Thank you. I think to me, you know, I have this. this uh, for some people, might be maybe silly emojis, but uh, I think it really fits into like this spectrum of belief. And I think when people hear that there can be a resurrection or even just approach the Bible or approach Jesus or approach God. I think uh, for, you know, the people maybe on the farthest, like the farthest away in the spectrum of belief is like, I'm an atheist. I don't believe I could care less about, you know, God or those type of things. Uh, but then there's also kind of like moving a little bit closer is the people that are questioning. So the skeptics, which I don't necessarily see it as bad, right? I think it's, it's mm -hmm. moving on on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And... When I hear this story, particularly, uh, I mean, one, it's about the resurrection, right? And not only the resurrection of Jesus, which I think for some people might be even easier to believe because, okay, he was God. And I think most people have right. that idea, right? Okay, Jesus is God. He can do whatever he wants. But on this one, it plays with so many human emotions. Like you said, you know, Jesus delayed to get there. You know, and people feel disappointed. So if you're going to wrestle with like 
a human, like a personal resurrection of sorts. Not just Jesus out there and he right. can, he's capable of everything, but my own personal resurrection. I feel like people are dealing with that disappointment of, I can't even approach Jesus. I'm disappointed in that guy because he shows up late. He shows up whenever he wants. Uh, we send word to him that his beloved you no know, brother or friend or uh, you no know, just this person he loves right and he didn't seem to care and i think that's where i find a lot of our society is uh, maybe asking that that question or feeling those same sentiments so i i think it's still like on that maybe like skepticism but i think people that come close to that is okay so why What is, what is the next step, right? And I think what you mentioned is, uh, well, you mentioned disappointment. I feel like all of us can, can kind of feel that. My question yeah. would be, how do you move somebody from that disappointment to Jesus or God? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a great question. I think a lot of people have disappointments that really just weigh them down, right? And it's mm -hmm. something, that, something that didn't go the way you wanted it to, a disappointment professionally or a relationship or financially or physically right or you know I'm, i'm and and it's a kind of resentment against god and i think the first thing beto is to first thing is to recognize it to recognize that i have this thing this disappointment that really is weighing me down whatever it is a resentment or a grudge or something and a lot of times that's something that you know it, it, it takes a while to kind of realize that that this is really something that i I'm sure you, people, you know in your own life or maybe in other people's lives, like they finally realize like, boy, this has really been weighing on me, you know? That the first mm. thing is to identify it. The second thing is to know that you can leave it behind, right? Um, you can leave it behind with help, with counseling, with therapy, but you know, just over time. But I would say, uh, interestingly, the most important thing for the believer uh, is to know who it is that's calling you out of that tomb and into, into new life. Mm. So that it is not just you doing it you know, on your own as a kind of self-help thing, which nothing wrong with that, but that there's someone calling you, that, that it is actually God kind of calling you into that. And that gives you a lot of trust. Hmm. So it's like, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of an image of like, uh, imagine like jumping in a pool as like a little kid. You know, if your parent or an adult or a swim teacher is there ready to kind of catch you, you're like, oh, okay, I'll do it because I trust that person. If they're in the pool, you're like, I trust that. Whereas if you did it by yourself, it would be a lot more frightening. So... So it's it's trusting the person who's calling you. That I think that's a lot. That's a big part of it. Wow, that's that's there's so much power in that. There's like trusting the person that's calling you. So one would be how do we identify that right. it's him calling us? But also, oh, there's just uh, I just want to think about that a little bit more. You know, like sure. who's the one doing the calling? Uh, that's very profound. I think that's so good. Yeah, so I guess the for some people who are disappointed, right, with with mm. God, it's almost like uh, it, I think there's a passage in Scripture too where there's a guy that says, "I I want to believe, help me believe," right? So right. I feel yeah. like some people it's not that they're atheist, it's like they they believe in God, but they're just disappointed at Him, right? So that's is that a that's a different space. And but also the notion of uh, of like for example, you mentioned a kid jumping in the pool and knowing that the parents gonna catch him. But it seems like with God, sometimes it does seem like he lets you drown a little bit. Even we can look at the example of Peter, right? When exactly. when he's walking on water yeah. and then he kind of drowns example. and then Jesus reaches out and, and lifts him up. But I, I think there's some power in that because I think that's how we grow, right? That's how we maybe just become, I don't know, we, we, we have a newer understanding of ourselves, of life, maybe a bigger commitment to to whatever is our endeavor we're in, right? So I, I, I think that's the hard part, right? Because if you trust Jesus, he's going to grow you. No, it is. Right. That's a really good, that's a good insight. And, you know, um, Peter, I mean, the, the, the interpretation is that Peter kind of takes his eyes off of Jesus. He sees the storm and he, he sinks. And, you know, we don't know exactly what was going through Peter's mind, but certainly he would have been, you know, a little afraid. And 
I think that's a really interesting point that sometimes Jesus does kind of let you sink a little bit or God does. It seems like it. I can't speak for God, but mm -hmm. and then it does strengthen you. Um, I, and I think part of the part of the, the disappointment in people is they feel like when they're a believer, sometimes the, the gospel is presented to them in the wrong way. And they say, oh, if I'm a believer, nothing wrong will ever happen to me. I'll, nothing ever bad will ever happen to me. Which is crazy. I mean, something bad is always happening. There, there's going to have bad stuff in your life, goods and bads. That doesn't mean that God doesn't like you. It doesn't mean that God isn't with you. Uh, it just means that, you know, you have to look harder for God's presence, right? Um, it may be a little bit of a teaching moment, but that God is still with you. God is still, you know, when the, when the disciples are in the boat during the storm at sea, they say, don't you care? Jesus is still there, even though it might not seem like he's paying attention. So, mm -hmm. so you know, it, it's funny you said, said that, Beto. I think disappointment in God is also something that can keep us really unfree and that mm -hmm. we may have to say, you know, I, I, I got to let go of that. I got to let go of this idea that everything's going to be perfect because I'm a believer. Mm -hmm. So that, that's something else that keeps us unfree. Yes. Wow. That's so good. Wow. I agree. Okay. So, Maybe let's personalize this because you wrote this book and I mean, I'm just going to kind of like glance here. It's 300 and something pages, right? So it means a lot to you just from, from what I can see. So if we would take it personal, where have you experienced maybe, and I don't know if you, know, you want to open up like that or no, just whatever, right? But where have you experienced, why does this story mean so much to you? Where can you say, this is my own journey, this is my own experience with resurrection yeah sure thanks for asking that well you know the story itself has always been very meaningful to me ever since i was a, a kid i saw now this is way before your time in 1977 it's still on youtube uh there was a series called jesus of nazareth that came out it was always on tv during eastern christmas and the scene of the resurrection just blew me away i mean it was just so powerful and that kind of captivated me and i thought like who is this guy who is this lazarus and what is this story and raising summer from the dead and then years later, I went to visit the place where Lazarus uh, is raised from the dead uh, outside of Jerusalem, and I found it really powerful. And I went into the tomb. You go down into the tomb. It's 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 down maybe a flight of stairs in this kind of stone cavern. It's pretty incredible. And I that was the image that came to my mind. What do I want to let go of? You know, what do I want to kind of leave behind? You know, in my own life, I talk about this in the book. I think one of the things that I've had to leave behind, um, you know, particularly as a writer. Uh, is this need to be like loved or liked or approved of by everything by everyone right or everything you know i think when you're like in junior high school or college you just want people to like you you know it's all about being cool and who's going to like me and who doesn't like me and and i found you know as as life went on that was more and more kind of paralyzing because you know you, you can't not everyone's going to like you now i mean everyone didn't like jesus right and he was perfect and so so I think I had to kind of let go of that. And I talk about that in the book about letting go of that and experiencing freedom to really, you know, be the kind of person that God wants you to be. So and Jesus was my model model in all this because, you know, he 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 had to leave Nazareth, too, when people didn't like him. So so the freedom from the need to be loved, liked and approved of was really powerful for me in my own life. That's good. So would you say uh, you gave up like maybe the approval of men? And do you feel like approved more by God now that you got kind of like let go of that? Is that is that what you were like seeking? Like, oh, I I got God's got me. I'm okay with that rather than you know anybody well, else. That's, that's or, a good question. I don't know if I would say that God kind of approved me more, you know, because that that's up to God really. But I would say I was free from the that need. I mean, let, let's just say something, you know, for for your show. Let's say that you decided that the only shows that you would do. I mean, it's going to sound crazy are shows that every single person would like and you mm. first of all there's no way to do that and you know imagine beto how paralyzing that would be you mm. wouldn't be able to like move or do anything you know so that was so that's part of it it's it's just that would kind of weigh you down and make it more difficult for you to do what you think god wanted you to do if you were only thinking about other people's approval so it's it's that kind of thing that kind of has to die for us that we just kind of have to let go in my own life that was the one thing that I pointed to in the book that just had to be kind of let go. You know, you got to leave it behind in the tomb. Mm -hmm. Wow. So let's talk about the progression of the power of the resurrection. Because I think, you know, from my understanding, I'm not like you know, a scholar or anything like that. I'm more like the layman who loves to talk about theology and things like that. 
with experts because I would consider you, you know, someone super qualified. Uh, so from my vantage point, I think Jesus starts revealing more of who he is, like little by little and more about his character. I mean, from the get go, he says, I'm here and the kingdom of heaven is now here. So he establishes that, but then he starts like showcasing what that looks like. So what I love is that from, from maybe the timeline that I picture in my mind, it seems like the, the more he shows us what he's capable of, the more this idea of the resurrection starts like sprinkling in, right? So one of them would be Jesus kind of resurrects a girl who's basically dead, right? Even though some people say, I mean, he says right. she's not dead, right? So, right. Uh, but I'm, I'm kind of like just assuming that he, he's saying that because, you know, he, she was, but he's saying, no, she's not dead. And no, there's maybe like uh, historical context to that because, uh, you know, the, the police of that time were there and you couldn't touch a dead body and things like that. So maybe Jesus you know, refers to it in a different way so that they don't you know, go up in arms. But then from that, the resurrection of his friend Lazarus. So a little bit more of like, wow, Jesus can actually do, he's got divine power, he's got divine authority and ultimately the cross, right? Like Jesus dies on the cross, but resurrects. And what I love is that afterwards like i mean that's basically like the the biggest showcase of the power of god that you can bodily resurrect even in this on this planet from the dead and but then also kind of like jesus hangs out with the disciples after the resurrection you know people say you know the disciples even say you know we saw him for i don't know how many days like 500 days something like that or 500 500 people saw him for 40 days something mm -hmm. along those lines i always get numbers wrong but uh Me i mean jesus jesus hangs out with his peeps afterwards right and then i read something like and um like the book of james the book of first peter maybe the book of john where the, the I mean, these are the basically the the disciples of Jesus writing these letters, and they say basically in other words. And today I don't want to focus you know on like antichrist and that type of stuff you know and false prophets. But what I love is that basically they say this is how you know who's calling and who's knocking, and they say we believe this, and it's almost like kind of like the Apostles' Creed, but the summary, right? We believe Jesus came in the flesh, so that like the incarnation. And we believe he died and we believe he rose from the dead and that Jesus is God, right? So like those, maybe just, just take those four statements from like the early disciples. Uh, so put that all in perspective of what Jesus is trying to teach us, right? You, you know, I think, I think that's what, what you said is very profound. I really do believe that, that you, you said that very well, that from the beginning, it's clear, at least to the reader, it may not have been clear to the disciples who he mm. is, right? I mean, the reader knows, right? But you're right, through the Gospels, I think that's very profound. Through the Gospels, he is, um, you know, revealing more and more of himself, right? And and you're right, and it does, it it, it's, it leads you up to, uh, I think, the, you know, the, the story of the raising of Lazarus, where he finally says, I am the resurrection and the life. Mm. Not just... I'm going to oh, give wow. resurrection in life, but I am resurrection in life, which is really profound, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I am life. That is that is quite the thing to say, and so therefore it's it's kind of you're right. It's kind of leading up to the ultimate um, event in Jesus's life, which is the resurrection, right? Which is the thing that changes everything. Um, and so I, I tend to think that, I think you're right, I think that it, it, it's kind of revealed slowly. I mean, the disciples have a hard time understanding. I mean, it's not surprising. How, we, we tend to, like, critique the disciples for not getting it, but how, how could they possibly <laughs> you know, understand yeah. this? Um, by the same token, you know, he is giving them, uh, in, in, the, in the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he's giving them the miracles, the works of power. In John's Gospel, which I love, they're called signs. They are signs of, of mm. who he is. Yes. Uh, and yeah, and then at the end, it's it's fully revealed. It's it's fully revealed in the resurrection. The, it, the, his full identity. Um, but it is something because even after that, even even after that, they still, you know, they still have they still have a hard time. And yes. I I love thinking about uh, one of my favorite sort of pet thoughts is what what did the the risen the glorified body as they call it or the risen Christ look like? 
because as you know, in some Gospels, they, they don't recognize him. I mean, it's clearly him. In other Gospels, they do. So it must have been something that is so uh, 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 unique, right, that, that they had a hard time even describing it, you know. So mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just fascinating. Um, and actually, over my shoulder up there, there's a, um, there's a picture of, uh, that's, that's an image of Thomas. That's supposed to be the Apostle Thomas seeing surprised? Jesus. Surprised? Yeah, surprised. As, okay. As, as, as very <laughs> surprised. Oh, um that's great so um yeah so i love that picture it's very real uh so yeah so it's it's a beautiful thing to think about for me that 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 it's a kind of a gradual revelation right it, like you said it's very well put it is clear at the beginning the kingdom of god is here right even in, in mark mm -hmm. but it's, it's it takes them a while to just you know they're human beings they have a hard time getting at it even after he's resurrected they've done and look even we have a hard time getting jesus i mean getting our minds around the mystery it's a mystery we're never going to understand it you know uh and which i think is kind of beautiful you know fully human fully divine it, it's it's hard for us to get our minds around it so it's a it's a mystery that we have to just keep pondering for our whole lives mm -hmm. wow that's so good okay i'm just <laughs> kind of like segue real quick because sure. I thought it was funny and I wanted to say something that, I don't know, might upset some people or maybe not, but we'll see. But for the people that are just listening to the show, so Father Jim has in the back of his room a bunch of books, a computer, some pictures. But one of the pictures he mentions of St. Thomas being surprised looks a whole lot like Messi. Like the soccer player, like super surprised, like about scoring a goal. <laughs> and I was, I just saw him, I'm like, wow, that's like Messi yeah. in the, what's the team he's in? Um, mm -hmm. Orlando or something like that. Anyways, yeah, well, I'm a soccer what, fan. Knows, <laughs> I had knows, to bring who it knows, up. Who knows, what, who knows what the apostles, we have no idea what the apostles look like. So. Right. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you something, Betsy, something really interesting, which I found fascinating um, reading some of these. A lot, I did a lot of research for this book. And we tend to think of the apostles as super old, but who knows? Mm. I mean, they could have been 17, 18, 19. Uh, wow. You know, when James and John uh, are called from the, the shore of the Sea of Galilee, they're, they're working for their father's company. So therefore, if lifespan at the time was like 40, 50, and their father is in their 40s, may, they may they be 20 years old. So we tend to think of them as super old. And, you know, now Peter was married, so he's probably a little older. But the other ones could have been, you know, could have been... 20s 30s who knows it's it's really fascinating to think about it wow yes that's so good i love that and it, it gives me so much hope i guess in a sense you know that you're talking how jesus kind of reveals who he is little by little uh but then showcases that his power really is it's about resurrecting life right and i love how you you emphasize that jesus said i am the resurrection and the life right and not i am capable of resurrecting yeah. like i am that so i mean that's authoritative right there yes. and also gives us i guess for us uh, just <laughs> no, the common human just the realization that god is so patient and that he's in a sense maybe waiting for us right like he i know we talked about delays but also uh, he's I just I just get the sense you know like you said you know the disciples didn't get it right away and even after Jesus resurrects they they still kind of didn't get it it's until like you know Jesus breaks bread for some of them and yeah. gives them and like oh and they don't even yeah. realize that's Jesus right so there's all that mystery of of not recognizing him in as Jesus in in the body like mm -hmm. physical body but then recognizing, I love how, you no, know, kind of like if, if we put all of the ideas together that we've been mentioning, like who's the one calling you out of the tomb, right? And how do you identify that voice? And then thinking of even the disciples couldn't clearly identify that voice until they saw an act from Jesus yeah, that right. re made him remember when they were with him prior, right? So in this case, like the, like I find Jesus like cooking a meal for them and they're on the boat and they're kind of like going back to their business after after yeah. jesus hung on the cross they're like okay it's over right i mean this yeah, we, we follow exactly. the wrong guy and then jesus calls them to shore and he's cooking a meal for them but they still don't recognize it so it's until he breaks the bread that they're like oh this is jesus right so i wonder all that to to, to bring it to like I wonder if people have had those experiences maybe already with Jesus and they don't realize it was him calling them, 
right? I think that's absolutely right. I think that, you know, um, there are so many times that people have experiences of, you know, whatever, awe or wonder or gratitude or, or some some sort of special moment that happens in their life. And I, I really believe that these are invitations for us to say yes or no. And it's up to us to say yes or no. I'll tell you a story once, mm-hmm. uh, or not once. I'll tell you a story that I was at a, I was doing a baptism. So I'm a priest. I do baptisms. And um, someone who was at this baptism, you know, it's a very sacred moment. And, you know, the parents were there. And one of the guests said to me, I felt this overwhelming sense of peace, you know, when you poured the water over the baby's head. And I said, and this is a person who was kind of on the fringes of the church. And I said, well, you know, I mean, you're having this moment of grace in the middle of a sacrament. I said, it's pretty clear to me that, you know, it sounds like God's kind of inviting you to something or to look at something. And she said, oh, no, no, I was just being emotional. And so, you know, we can say yes or no to these moments. You know, we like you said, you know, I think that there are times when God is revealing himself to us or Jesus is revealing himself to us in very simple things. You know, um, I think what I love about your talking about that story in, in John 21 uh, is that it's very simple. He's 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 risen, of course, but he's he's making fish. He's cooking fish on the seashore. It's all about something simple. Uh, in the in the road to Emmaus, he just breaks the bread. It's really simple stuff, and mm. I think we tend to overlook God in the in the simple things. Um, wow. and, but I, I really believe this. I'm really kind of really strong about this. That y- you know, it's up to us to say yes or no. Like I think God's mm. continually inviting people, and I know people listening to this channel. Some people might be atheists or agnostics or skeptics. I would just say, be open to the possibility to, that those things that are happening are really God's invitation to you. Wow, there, there's so much power right there. I love that idea. Uh, sometimes God is more in the simple than in the, the I don't know, the, the explanation of how the universe was made. I, I don't care particularly, right? I, I mean, I do care and I, I kind of believe what scripture says. But at the same time, I love that idea of like the simplicity of life and and to think like Jesus cooking a meal and if I if I picture it in my own family and th- just yesterday I have three kids my oldest is 14 today today's his birthday oh happy uh, birthday thanks and then my youngest is seven and it's the girl melody and then in the middle is my boy Dorian right and yesterday I was driving with my little girl she's seven and I I, I just felt this sense of joy of being alive and I said Melody you know what I'm so happy because in this life I guess the greatest joy I've experienced is just to have a family and to have you guys and to be able to Beautiful. do the simple stuff right like break bread with you like have have a meal together it's that simplicity that I feel like God's been God's in the middle of that Absolutely. And let me just thank you for sharing that. It's really profound. And let me just say something in response. You know, there's this beautiful uh, uh, experience of you, and it makes sense, with your family and experiencing God's presence and experiencing gratitude and love in a really, let's just say, a, a noticeable way, right? A real noticeable way. And I, I think it, it a couple things. First of all, it's happening in a very um, ordinary setting, right? In, in your car with, with your daughter driving down the street, you know, it's not like some big, you know, thing happens in the sky or something. That's the first thing. So that that God happens, you know, we say in the Jesuits, God meets you where you are. Hmm. God meets you where you are. And that that's where you are. But the second thing is really, I think, um, might be helpful for listeners. A lot of people might dismiss that. If it happens to them, they might just say, oh, and then they go on to something else. And then someone cuts them off and they yell at someone and call, you know, curse them out, you know, on the road or whatever. Or then they drop their kid off and they just forget it. But I think the invitation for us is to say that that this is a moment of of invitation for, for God to say, hey, for, for you to say, hey, I accept this and I, I, I hear you, God, and I want to say yes to this and I thank you, God. And And I think so many people, they, they look for proof, and I'm saying this to the agnostics and atheists, they look for proof and they say, if God would only prove to me, or if I would only have an experience, and that's the kind of experience, exactly what you're describing, that is the way that God most often reaches out to us. Mm. And the the, the, the the invitation is to say yes to that. So I would say that that's probably the, one of the best explanations of the ways that God, I might quote you on this too, because it was so <laughs> beautiful. That's so the best explanation, the way that God reaches out to us 
Mm. And the people say, where's the proof? You know, that's the proof. And that's the invitation. And all we need to do is to be able to say, like Mary says, yes. Mm. That's all we need to do. So good. Okay. Is it time to summarize the episode with our emojis and walk through the five of them, either to recap or think of the future? Okay. So, Father Jim, what is the most blasphemous idea that you have heard or that you think it's out there? I think we've not heard any. You mean on the show today? Yeah, or just in general about the topic uh, of maybe the resurrection or along those oh, lines. I, I think we've been. I think we've stayed away from any blasphemous thing. So I think we're okay. No, I, don't, <laughs> I haven't heard any blasphemous thing. Nice. That's a first. Okay, I love it. Let's move on to skeptical. What are you still maybe skeptical of, or where do you see skepticism played out? You mean in the, in, in the story or in my life or? I guess, I mean, yes, in the story, but I don't know if in your life you've seen it too. I'm, I'm, whichever. That's interesting. I, I would say there is a little bit of confusion about um, in this particular story. It's not skepticism. It's kind of confusion. Why does Jesus wait? That There's a little mm. confusion. I talk about that in the book a little bit. Mm. Tease us up with <laughs> maybe a little bit of an answer. <laughs> What? Say that again? Yeah, just can you tease us up with a little bit of an yeah. answer to that delay? Yeah. So one of the um, uh, one of the things that is helpful to know historically is that Jewish people of the time, and a lot of this is Amy Jo Levine, mm -hmm. um, who reminds us that Jewish people of the time thought that the soul hovered over the body for about two or three days, mm -hmm. and that one of the reasons Jesus is waiting is to let everybody know, like this guy's dead. Mm. Like, you know, the two, you were talking about Jairus' daughter, like, mm -hmm. she just died and he came and people might say, well, she was mm. just asleep. I think he's saying, look, and he says it in the gospel story, Lazarus is dead. Mm. Um, so I think one of the reasons he delays is because of this, this belief and mm. to, to, to show people like he's really dead. Love it. Okay. Inspired emoji. Where do you see hope or what inspires you? Uh, your story about your daughter inspired me. Mm, love it. Thank you. A holy idea, according to Father James Martin. <laughs> I, love, I love the sound effect. <laughs> um, uh, the holy idea is that uh, Jesus offers us all new life. And that's so that's so consoling and so beautiful for all of us. And then, and in the every, as you were saying, as in the everyday. Mm. In the everyday. Love it. And finally, the highest idea you can think to, think of, the divine idea. Uh, Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Mm. Think about that. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. What could be the implications of that phrase for your own journey of faith? This has been such an amazing, wonderful conversation. Let's party it out. You guys ready? Okay, so Father James, where can people you know, find your resources? Maybe get this book or where do you want to point people to? Yeah, sure. So Come Forth, The Promise of Jesus' Greatest Miracle is available in print, on ebook, uh, as an audiobook. I read it myself. It is available, as they say, everywhere good books are sold. So everywhere online, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your bookstores, everywhere. So Come Forth, The Promise of Jesus' Greatest Miracle. Hope you enjoy it. Right, there you have it my friends an amazing conversation i'm just so grateful for this opportunity to talk to so many people in topics that i love theology christianity even i don't know ecumenical stuff like this it's just so 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 empowering and i want to invite you to check out more of our episodes at christianpodcast.com give us your opinion give us your review send us your comments we're on every single platform youtube roku tv uh spotify apple Podcasts, like all of those places give us a positive review if not move on to something else like i always say just give us a five star or listen to something else there's other podcasts out there but i'll see you guys on the next one thank you for being here <laughs>